We're in our series about strategic goals for our church in 2013. The first strategic goal that we're looking at is that of evangelism. I've entitled today's sermon, Slow Down and See How God is Working. John chapter 4, verses 35 to 38, we'll end up referring and referencing the, the whole chapter, but I want you to look at just verses 35. Let me back up to verse 34 and get the flow of the context. John 4, beginning at verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered in to their labor. Life is fast-paced. we got so many gadgets to make it slower, and what we do is we just get all these slow things and we put them all together. Um, texting is now combined with driving, right? We have to pass laws so people will slow down and pay attention. Texting and driving do not go together, but we've made them that way. Life is fast. We want life microwave. We want, we're, we're in such a hurry that we're always late. Have you noticed that? We're in such a hurry that we're always late. We've got so many things crammed into our day that we can't make it to all of them. We have a problem. And the bigger problem is that we're not slowing down enough to pay attention to what God's doing. We're missing it. In the Old Testament it says, be still and know that I am God. If we're still for 30 seconds, the silence is too much. What I want you to think about is, how many opportunities have you missed because you've just been too busy. How many opportunities have I missed because I'm just too busy? Well, this story, we, we need to be busy about the right, right things. This story finds Jesus weary. And he's weary from his labors. And yet, he slows down. And he faithfully shares the good news with a Samaritan woman. By the way, she had two strikes against her. She was a Samaritan, that's an outcast of Israel, uh, not pure Israel and not pure Gentile, um, the worst of both worlds. And she was a woman, and that day women were highly discriminated against, and by the way, when Women's Lib says that Christianity and the gospel are uh, prejudiced against women, they don't understand the gospel, because Jesus spent a lot of time elevating the role of women. And we need to understand that the gospel frees women and men. we got two words going on in the passage. If you look back at verse 6, if you've got your text open, look back at verse 6. Let me read that to you. Jesus has gone through Samaria. He's, he's actually come to Samaria, a town in Samaria, verse 5, called Sychar. Near the field of Jacob that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. Verse 6, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. It wasn't just the journey that Jesus was wearied by. If you look at the context, he was wearied from all the things that traveled up, that, that led up to his traveling through Samaria. And this word wearied is the same word that's used in verse 38 of our text today, where Jesus said, I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, wearied themselves. It's the same word. Everything in this text now centers around the fact that somebody's weary. 
You've got this inclusio. You've got the bookend. You've got the very first one where Jesus is weary. You've got the, the very last bookmark and where those who have labored, they've wearied themselves in laboring. Everything in here is about the proper perspective, how to be weary and do right. However, we have a contrast in the middle of this. In the contrast to Jesus who is tired and yet faithful, the disciples, we see them loving food more than ministry. They, they love food more than ministry. Our perspective often gets skewed by our fleshly desires. And let's face it, food's one of those things that just we crave in a wrong way. We need food to survive, but how much and what kind? So we need to get a spiritual perspective. Down to your notes. We need to get a spiritual perspective. Jesus' disciples needed a spiritual perspective, and they got one that day. We're going to get one. See, all the disciples could see was their desire for food. That, that was their, the thing that consumed them, was their desire for food. Back in verse 8 of chapter 4, I've got it on the, on the slide, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. That is not the end of the story for them with the food issue. Verse 31, when they came back, they saw him talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman, and they were urging Jesus. He's talking, he's witnessing to this Samaritan woman at the well, and they're saying, look, you got to eat. Rabbi, eat. They're trying to divert his attention from ministry to food. I don't think before studying this, I understood the relationship to inactivity and food to spiritual blindness and food. One commentary said, the disciples had more pressing concerns than the, than the evangelism of an entire town. They showed le legitimate concern for their leader and friend, confident that he must be exhausted and hungry. But their spiritual immaturity prohibited them from seeing into the spiritual realities of the situation. All they could see was food. He's got to be hungry. He needs to eat. And that's why when we look at our text, back in verse 32 of your text, I don't have it written down for you in your notes, but if you look, look at verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anybody brought something him something to eat they missed the whole thing they, they were so focused on food they missed the spiritual battle that was going on they missed the spiritual uh, ministry that jesus was entered into you see if we only have a fleshly perspective we'll miss what god is doing if we only have a spiritual perspective or a fleshly perspective, we'll miss what God's doing. We'll miss the spiritual perspective. So Jesus changes their, their thinking. He says, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? As I was studying this big battle in the commentaries, this is a parable of the day. Some say, makes sense, got to be a parable. Others are saying, this is just a reality that he's really talking about the harvest isn't right now for the, for the natural food, the plants to be harvested. So there's this big controversy over, is this just a, a parable, a statement of the day? Or is this really, this is, how, this is where we are, four months from har harvest. Some say, this is a parable, kind of like... Um, are there not yet four months to the harvest? Oh, like Rome wasn't built in a day. We know that. But what's the point? We'll get to that in just a bit. We have to, we have to wrestle with this. Is this a reality or is this what, it's just a metaphor Jesus is using? I believe he, he really was a 
four months till harvest. See, a, a fleshly perspective says, now isn't the time for harvesting. When we only look about the flesh, we forget all that God's doing in the world, and we say, well, it's just, it's just a hard time we live in. Now's not the time for harvest. The, the reaping of souls, that's going to come later. And we, we lose our perspective. We just focused on the here and now and how difficult evangelism is and how difficult witnessing is. Sometimes we get a fleshly perspective that says, what's the rush? We've got plenty of time. These are just young people. These are physically fit people. What's the rush? And sometimes a fleshly perspective says, we've done all we can do. We've planted the seed. Our job is done. We're done. That's all fleshly. We're going to talk about what is our response. What should our response be? So Jesus reminds his disciples uh, with three imperative verbs that real sight comes through spiritual eyes. In verse 35, there are three verbs used all in the imperative. An imperative means it's got to be done right now. It's not negotiable. It's imperative that you do this. It, It needs to be done now. So he uses three words in verse 35. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. So the three words are, first of all, look. And this literally means to pay attention, to listen up. We would say, look here, pay attention. I've got something important to say, I need your full attention. We would would get down on the level of a little child and put their face in our hands and say, are you listening to me? Right? Have you ever done that as a parent? Raise your hand, yes. I've done that as a parent. Are you listening to me? And they do everything they can not to listen. Like, (laughs) right, rolling the eyes up in the heaven and they're down and they're they're blinking and they're not going to look you in the eye because... There's this little hard rebellion going on there. But you want them to focus, right? Pay attention to me. And so that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, I've got something very important for you. Listen up. Pay attention. The second verb is lift, and the phrase is lift up your eyes. We would say, open your eyes. Pay attention to what's all going on around you. Listen to me. There's more than food issues here. We got something bigger going on. What he's really saying to them is twofold. I didn't have room to put it in your notes, but uh, first of all, stop thinking so much about food. You know, those fleshly things that consume our lives, that, that we, 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 we uh, rotate our lives around these special little idols of ours. And nothing can happen until my special little idol is met. And many times it's food. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's family. By the way, family's become the new idol today. Sometimes it's just being busy. Sports even. I hate to say it, but the Packers even. Okay, can become an idol. A thing that everything else has to fit around. When I first came to this church... Uh, before people realized that I was actually going to preach past kickoff. Um, we actually had people get up and leave for kickoff. I'm like, are you serious? And then after a year or so, I think they left, but um, <laughs> they realized, I don't care about kickoff. All right, the Packers make too much money for playing a sport. The only benefit I get is cheering for them to make more money. It's not an eternal thing. Let's get our perspective right. It's not an eternal thing. So we, we've got these little idols. Stop thinking so much about them. Let, don't make them be consuming in your life. Let God consume you. The second thing is Jesus is telling them, so stop thinking that the Samaritans are evangelistically unworthy or unreachable. You see, some of the things that we've got going against us in evangelism are our own prejudices. And I'm not talking skin color. I'm talking styles and lives of people. Oh, they scare me. Get over it. Get over it. These are eternal souls. Just because they're different doesn't mean that they're unworthy 
of being reached with the gospel. Different doesn't mean they're necessarily any more evil than you are. They're just different. Just get over our prejudices. Get over our preconceived ideas of this type of people is easier to reach for Jesus than this type of people. Nobody's easy to reach for Jesus without him doing the work first. Right? And then when he does the work, it doesn't matter about lifestyle anymore because everyone who comes to Jesus Christ is a new creation. Man looks on the outward. God looks at the heart. The third verb is the word see. These are three completely different words for taking a look at something. And this word see means to observe something with continuity and attention. Often with the implication that what is observed is something unusual. I'll say so. A whole town of Samaritans coming to Jesus, that's unusual. Particularly when Jesus was sent to the Jews. So these three verbs need to be taken in their context. Jesus is saying, look, I, I got something going on here you're not getting. You just, you're not paying attention. It's not um, clicking with you. I'm going to try and explain it a little further. So by using a statement with double meanings, and that would be that statement about the harvest, the fields are white and the harvest, by using a statement with double meanings, Jesus is rebuking his disciples and helping them think differently. Nothing like a rebuke to make us think differently, if we don't harden our hearts toward it. See, the problem with a rebuke is pride, right? I'm okay with getting rebuked as long as they don't tell me what's wrong with me. Did you ever have that experience? You can tell me what you think as long as it doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. Because I really don't want to know what's wrong with me. Because I really think I'm okay. So do you. But Jesus doesn't care about what we think. He rebukes his disciples in a way that brings them to reality. And he uses this, the fields are white unto harvest, as a, a means of saying, look, you're missing it. If we take this literally, then Jesus was speaking in December or January, since the harvest would have been around March or April, and there would have been still four months until harvest time. So he's saying, look out on the fields. They're white under harvest, and the disciples are going, huh? I don't get it. They're, that's not harvestable material. The wheat's not ready yet. Anybody knows you don't harvest until March or April. But by stating the, field, the fields are, using a present tense word, that they are white under harvest, Jesus is refocusing his disciples. The idea is this, that at this point in time, the harvesting is overtaking the sowing. The harvesting is catching up with the planting. See, how can that be? Amos gives us a, a picture of this. Amos chapter 9 and verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Here's the cool thing about God. He doesn't operate on our calendar. He doesn't operate on our calendar. We say, well, that, that person's so hard to reach for the Lord. I hope that someday they come to Jesus. I just, I'm losing hope. I'm stopping praying for them. I'm not witnessing to them because they're just a lost cause. They're too difficult. Jesus doesn't operate on that kind of a lack of faith. And he doesn't want us to operate on that kind of a lack of faith. He wants us to believe that in God, all things are possible. We have to have faith. We can't just throw up our hands and say, what's the point? The point is, we need to be faithful to God. It's his job to convert souls. 
It's only our job to be faithful. We are called to be faithful. That's, that's our responsibility. And faithful means we believe and acknowledge that in giving out the word, God can use it in any way that he wishes. The idea was the Samaritans. No sooner had the good news been given and the harvest began to occur. Sometimes we think that, oh, we've got to pray for years and we've got to work for years and we've got to evangelize for years and we've got to talk for years, but that's not scriptural. Notice verse 30. Talking about the Samaritans. They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now, I get this. It's not just a couple Samaritans. You've got this Samaritan woman of, of uh, John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to her. whole discourse he's had with her about the eternal life and, and the spring of life flowing up in her. And she gets a little sassy. And then finally she gets it. And she goes back to town. And she tells people who she met. And they're going, hey, wait a second. It could be the Messiah. So they all march out of town based upon what this woman's testimony was. And the town's all coming together. Now, one commentator made an interesting point in that day. They would have been wearing white robes. So when you've got this herd of people coming dressed in white, and he says, look now, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, they're white unto harvest, it would have been obvious to the disciples what was going on. Here's this mass of white-robed people coming to Jesus. How cool would that have been? And what a rebuke that would have been to the disciples. The people of little faith. Regardless of whether or not they were wearing white, they were already coming. Which brings us to our next verse. The spiritual harvest is happening right now. The spiritual harvest is happening right now. We don't have to wait till tomorrow for it. We don't have to wait for God to send us the right people. We don't have to wait for open doors. There are more open doors than we're obvious, than, than we're looking for, and they're obvious if we just slow down and look. Verse 36, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. Already. So that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. This word already is an adverb. Adverbs tell us about verbs. So we have these verbs. There are four verbs in verse 36. Verbs show action. All of them can be prefaced with already. All of them. So if we put this adverb, already, in front of the verbs that we're going to see, we get a really cool picture of what's going on. And an adverb, is a po- uh, this already, is a point in time preceding another point in time and implying completion. It's already done. It's already happening. You don't have to wait for it for some future time. It's already happening. So let's take a look at these four present tense verbs which already applies to. There are four present tense verbs which already applies to. Number one is the word reaps. Already the one who reaps. The reaping is going on when? Right now. Right now. The reaping of the sowing has, is going on right now. It's already been sowed. Here comes the harvest right now. We don't have to wait in the future. It's right now. When is it? Right now. Matthew chapter, 39, chapter 9, verses 37 and 38 tell us what one of the problems is with the harvest. He said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, the issue isn't the lack of harvest. 
The issue is lack of laborers. The issue isn't the lack of people coming to Christ. The issue is the lack of people telling people about Christ. It's the lack of people going out and leading people to that faith in Christ. That's where the lack is. It's not in the lack of opportunities. It's not in the lack of willingness on the part of people who are lost. It's on our shoulders. There's a lack of laborers. We don't need to pray for people to be saved. We need to pray for people to tell people to be saved. That's where the problem lies. Is it wrong for, to pray for people to be saved? No, that's not my point. The point is, it takes more than a handful of people. There's a great harvest that should be happening. The problem is not the lack of people coming to Christ. The problem is the lack of laborers. And Jesus is rebuking his disciples. We're going to get into this whole idea of laborers and, and uh find out who is the laborer in the story the second verb is an action verb called receiving so already the one who reaps is receiving wages right now already it's already happening laborers are being paid right now already the distribution of wages is going on right now First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, the Apostle Paul tells us the same thing in a little bit different word. He said, he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. And here's the picture. You want a reward from God, get to work. There's no... There's no principle in Scripture of rewarding the lack of work. There's no scriptural precedent for that. God rewards work. He rewards kingdom work. He rewards spiritual work. He rewards our effort, our labor, the things that we're doing for Him. He rewards it. If you want to lay up treasures in heaven, get busy. It's just the principles of Scripture. Get to work. How do we get to work? Be a testimony for Christ. Evangelize the lost. Open your mouth and tell them the truth about Jesus. Don't be intimidated by them. Share Christ because you don't know at what point God will use his word in the life of that person. It's interesting that Paul says, he who plants and he who waters are one. See, our job isn't done when we sow one seed. We may sow that seed and then water that seed for years. But God's already at work in the heart of that person. However hardened their hearts are today, however stubborn, however um, antagonistic they are to the gospel today, we don't know what God's doing in them. And our job is not to make them get saved. Our job is to share our faith with them. Our job is to share the good news with them. We leave the results up to God. That's why I'm against high-pressure evangelism. Too many people have mouthed words that we've talked them into. I'm convinced that when the fruit is ripe, it falls off the branch. And you get the privilege of picking without much work. That's what it means to labor. Put the work in the front end. Plant the seed, water the seed, and let God give the increase. But right now, the reaping is going on. Right now, the payment for those wages of those who've labored is going on. Three, there's a gathering going on. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. This word gathering, the accumulation and storing away of fruit is going on right now. When we evangelize, when people receive Jesus Christ as Savior, think about it. Eternal security is based upon the fact that God doesn't 
arbitrarily throw bad fruit out of his storehouse. He doesn't put bad fruit in his storehouse, and he doesn't let fruit go bad in his storehouse. God's fruit is all good fruit, meaning he securely keeps people for the day of eternal life, for the day of salvation. He eternally and securely keeps them. Because there's this gathering, this accumulation going on right now, this storing away going on right now. When we lead someone to Jesus Christ, a faith in Christ, and we preach to them the word of God, and they receive Jesus Christ by faith, their eternal soul is stored up in heaven. And they can't lose it. It's stored up there. See, Jesus' point must be taken, must be taken seriously for us as Christians. Eternal life is evidenced. If we have eternal life, if we say that we're born again, it's evidenced by our witness and not by our Bible knowledge. It's evidenced by our witness, not by our Bible knowledge. Because there are a lot of people who know a lot about the Bible who are not born again. But only truly born again people can tell others how to be born again because they've been there themselves. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 said, each one's work will become manifest. I mean, I mean it's going to be revealed to others. For the day, that is judgment day, will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test the sort of work each one has done. There's a day of judgment coming. Every believer is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and all of our works are going to pass through the fire of God's refinement. And whatever we've done in the flesh, whatever we should have done and didn't do, will pass through the fire. And theoretically, what comes out on the other side, or in the picture, what comes out on the other side, is the refined uh, ministries that we have done. Gold, silver, precious stones. But some people have wood, hay, and stubble. That all gets burned up. Paul goes on to say, and some are going to be saved like they, have, they themselves have passed through the fire. That's all they got. They've got nothing to show for it but their own soul. That scares me. Jesus didn't die to allow us to just get by. He died. His Holy Spirit indwells us. He's gifted us. He's commanded us to evangelize. Why? For the purpose of growing his kingdom. Not giving us some eternal security so that we can just sit back and coast. But so that we can get involved in kingdom work. So that we can share the gospel with people who don't know. And wherever we are in our life, whatever our occupation, whatever our relationships are, those are the platforms through which we minister. That's it. Those are the most important platforms through which we can minister the relationships that God's brought into our lives. Would you rather hear the gospel from someone you know or a complete stranger? And, And the gospel picture is, the Bible picture is relationship building. We need to build those relationships, not so we have a lot of friends, but for platforms through which to share the gospel. On that day, our work will be shown for what it is. So there's a gathering going on. I mean, if our work is going to be shown for what it is, the laborer and the reaper will stand together with the one who has received Christ, and they will present that one to Christ. And that one who labored and reaped will stand with those he worked with or she worked with and present theirs to Christ and you've got this whole accumulation of souls that we've all been interconnected with standing before the Lord and that's why the bride of Christ is such a beautiful picture it's not an isolated it's going to be me there all alone it's going to be us worshiping the Lord unashamed because we've ministered before him rightly today 
because the, th- the fourth one is rejoicing. This word rejoice. Let me read the verse to you again. All the, all, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and already gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice already. Already rejoice together. There's no competition in, in this issue of evangelism. No competition. We rejoice together. There's joy for both the sower and the reaper right now. Right now. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap, reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Sowing the seed is hard work. And sometimes when we sow the seed, we weep for those who reject it. Sometimes when we sow the seed, it's painful. But we keep on sowing the seed because it's what we're called to do. Imagine a farmer who said, it's just too hard to get up at 5 in the morning or 4 in the morning or whatever time they get up in the morning. And it's too hard to go out there. It's cold on some mornings. Yeah, I'm all alone in that tractor. It's dusty and dirty, planting those stupid seeds in the ground. How dumb would that be? Right? Planting a stupid seed on the ground is never going to grow anyway. Do we do that with evangelism, though? Planting that stupid seed in that person's life, it's never going to grow. Their heart's just too hard. How little is your God? The farmer plants a seed believing that God's going to send the rain, whether they acknowledge God or not. God's got to send the rain. And this little sprout begins underground. Away from visibility, pops through. It's still got a long ways to go. Pops through. And we want, as a goal, to see that thing become a full, ripe plant, which reproduces. That's, that's what our goal ought to be as children of God, allowing the Spirit of God to produce fruit in us that's transferable to others so that they can produce fruit, fruit, transfer it to others and produce fruit in them, and it just keeps growing. I'm so thankful for what God's doing in our church here um, I'm thankful for all of you. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by all of you sitting here today, and it's just cool to watch God work. But when's the last time you witnessed for Jesus Christ? When's the last time you shared the gospel with someone who was lost? When was the last time you went to the bank and witnessed to the teller? When's the last time you went inside at the gas station and witnessed to the gas station attendant? When's the last time you shared the gospel with someone? We need to be actively sharing. Build relationships. I've I've told people before, I go to the same gas station all the time. I go to the same bank all the time. If I see a checkout lane, I'll stand in line and go to the same person all the time because I want to build relationships. There's, you, you just, we've got to build those relationships. Jesus built a relationship with this woman in the well, at the well in a short amount of time. And she believed. Rejoicing is not dependent on the details of the harvest, but on the fact that there is a harvest. You know, sometimes the, the gospel gunners, if you will, they, they love to tell these dramatic stories of, how hard it was to lead this person to the Lord and, and, and all the great details of how this person wept, it's irrelevant. It's just, that's just a notch in their own gun. The reality is not how the person came to Christ because we all come the same way. Through humility, a recognition that we are overwhelmed with sin and lost. Whether that's accompanied with tears or not is irrelevant. The fact that there's been a harvest ought to cause us to rejoice. And we we need to get uncomfortable in sharing the gospel. For some of you, that's not going to take much. We've got to get uncomfortable in sharing the gospel. See, the disciples missed the impact of Jesus' words to the Samaritan woman because of their own prejudice. 
and because of their desire for food. Here Jesus goes through Samaria. He says, I got to go through Samaria. You go, the disciples, why? Bunch of low lives out there. Why go there? I've bought a lot of other places we can go that are more profitable. I got to go through Samaria. They come back, and they see him talking to a woman. And he's, he's ministering to her. And when we find in verse 27 of chapter 4, then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking to a woman or with a woman. But no one said, what, are you, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Why? They were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. You know why? He rebuked them on the spot. He would tell them off right there. We're so politically correct, we don't want anybody telling us that we have something wrong. But it, Jesus didn't care about political correctness. He says, you got, you, I mean, Peter, you're of Satan. Get behind me, Satan. This is the leader of the 12, by the way. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. Okay, you're, you're Peter. You've just been told that. What are you going to do? Well, I'm Satan been with you for three years I'm start making excuses for why I do what I do Jesus didn't care about political correctness but the disciples missed it they missed it no one said what do you seek or why are you talking with her they thought it they didn't have the courage to say it I think the parable of the lost son illustrates the loss of joy which occurs when anger and bitterness steal joy. You know, we have in our mind the right kind of people to come to Jesus. We want a church full of people who are normal. Are you normal? Is normal good? We've lowered what normal ought to be, by the way, in our society, right? So, really, do we want to Church of normal people? It'll never happen. Do we want a church of people like me? Bald and in their mid-50s? No! Do we want a church of just young people? No! Do we want a church of just senior citizens? No! We've got to get out of this mindset of what our church ought to look like and let God build it. And not be respecters of people. But we got to get out of this mindset of our church. We need to be safe as well. I think some of the lost people in our society, the unreached people groups in our society, are the dangerous ones. And if you were here a couple weeks ago, talked about how my heart's desire is to reach people hooked on drugs and alcohol and start a ministry committed to ministering to them. Is that a safe ministry? Are you kidding? What are we going to do with pedophiles? That present, it presents some real problems, doesn't it? Are they unworthy of the gospel? Not at all. What are we going to do with people just released from prison? These are unreached people groups in our own community. What are we going to do with them? They need the gospel. They make us uncomfortable. But they're eternal souls who will live forever in heaven or in hell. There are other people groups in our community that might scare us. But let's get scared and obey rather than get scared and do nothing. The lost son comes back. He squandered everything the father gave him. The brother in self-pity starts giving his reasons why the father shouldn't bless the son and shouldn't accept him back. And the father in love simply says, in verse 32 of Luke 15, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. It's the right thing to do. For your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. 
Let's stop being respecters of people. We start ministering to people regardless of how they make us feel. Fulfilling our God-given roles is what really matters. John 4, 37 For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. Let's fulfill our God-given roles. Our God-given role as people of God is to evangelize the lost. Every Christian must be involved or is involved in sowing and reaping. If you're a true Christian, you will be a witness. It's not negotiable. You will be a witness. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15. Paul said, through us, that is, the apostles, spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. We're just a sweet aroma to everybody we meet. For we are the aroma of, of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We make life different in a good way for the lost and those who are being saved. We're a positive influence in our culture. I think the church has fallen down there, and we need to be a positive influence in our culture. Jesus said, one sows, another reaps. So some sow, they give the word of God to the lost. There are some who just, they get out there and, and they're just workhorses for, for God and they're, they're just telling people about Jesus over and over and over. Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. The diaspora has taken place again. The, the Christians now are scattered because of persecution. And they start witnessing wherever they go. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. They just, they just knew what they needed to do. They just told people about Jesus. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Do you find that interesting that Samaria is the, the beneficiary of the gospel so many times? The, these outcasts. Philip goes down to Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. See, those people that we think are unsavable, they're the very ones God's at work in. Those people that make us the most uncomfortable, they're the very ones that God's at work in. See, because my history and, and what I know from Scripture, nice people don't need Jesus because life's okay for them. It's the people who are down and out. It's the people who have messed up their lives. It's the people who have, have wasted their whole life. They're the ones who know, I'm in sorry shape, and I need hope, and I need help. Some are called to sow to that. Get busy. Let's do it. Some are called to reap. They get to be involved in lost people confessing Christ as Savior. But it's usually as a result of someone else sharing good news with them. Rarely does the reaper of souls also be, is he also or she also the sower initially. Rarely. But it happens. So as I close out, let me just focus on Jesus' last statement. And make this statement. Every true follower of Jesus has a specific role to fulfill. It might be sower. It might be reaper. It might be both. But get busy. Get busy. Verse 38, Jesus said, I sent you to reap that for, what, for, for which you did not sow or labor. Others have labored. And you've entered into their labor. Think about this. Who are the sowers, the laborers. Well, initially it was Jesus. He's the one that went weary to the well, waited for the Samaritan woman to come, and engaged her, even though he was weary, in conversation. She then hears, she believes, she goes back to the town, and she says to the people, look, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. 
And based upon her testimony, they said, could this be the Messiah? And they all come out. Just that simple little testimony that he told me everything I ever did. That's his, that's, that would be like us saying, you know, Jesus showed me that I was lost and on my way to hell. I was a sinner. I don't have to give you the details of everything I got involved in. She says, he said, go, give, go, go bring your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. Yeah, you're right. You've had five, and the man you're with isn't your husband. He didn't dwell on all the facts. He just pointed it out. You've really messed up your life. You need the Lord. I'm him. She goes back. And based on her testimony, the whole town comes out. So who were the laborers? Jesus initially, and then the woman. It's interesting to know who wasn't the laborer. The sent ones. The apostle. They weren't laboring. They missed it. They missed it because their focus was on fleshly things. They missed it. Some are sent to sow the seed of the word of God. Luke 8, 5. Jesus gives a parable. He says, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. The issue is not the four soils at this point. The issue is the seed had to fall as a result of the sower sowing. In Mark chapter 4, verse 3, Jesus says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. What's the purpose of a sower in that day? To sow seed. He had a pouch draped over his shoulder. He'd reach in, he'd get a handful, he'd throw the seed out. It wasn't his responsibility to make sure that none fell on the hard-packed path. He had one responsibility. Spread it out. Sow the seed out there and let God do the work of growing it. Too often, we want to make sure it doesn't fall on the hard-packed path. Too often, we want, to, we want to make sure it doesn't fall on the shallow ground. It doesn't fall into the weedy soil. It only falls into the, the good soil. It's not our job. Our job is simply to sow the word, not to make sure it lands on fertile soil. Neither the sower nor the reaper has anything to boast about. See, there are, there are groups within Christianity who give these big awards for how many souls that you've won this year. You've just lost your reward, by the way. you just lost your reward because you've got nothing to boast in. God gives the increase, not man. It's not based on my technique. It's not ba- based upon my personality. It's not based upon my persuasiveness. It's based upon God using His infinite and living Word to transform lives. See, it takes the pressure off. It's my job to give it out. It's God's job to make it grow. Our problem is not God's not making it grow. Our problem is we're not giving it out. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7 Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. I I give a report. I give an annual report. And in that annual report, how many people were saved? I really feel weird about saying that. It's good for you to know people are being saved. I don't want any credit for it. God did it. And I'm really happy that some others of you were led to the Lord by others than me so that it doesn't go into my report. Because we all need to be working together. We all need to be transforming uh, our own, having our lives transformed so that we're involved in the transformation of others as God does his work. See, both the sower and the reaper must be busy in the harvest. Both the sower and the reaper have to be busy in the harvest. If there's no sowing, there's no reaping. And if there's sowing without reaping, the crop goes to waste. Both need to be busy. Mark chapter 13, verses 34 to 
to 36, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. He makes this statement. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work. Understand that this is the picture of Jesus going away, leaving us to do the work that he's now ceased doing on earth. And he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. Stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. Jesus is coming back. If he doesn't come back in our lifetime, we'll die. We'll stand before him, and we'll give an account. The account simply will be, were you awake and working, or were you sleeping at the wheel? Were you awake and working, or were you sleeping at the wheel? My prayer for us is, as the people of God is that we'll be awake and working. We don't need more programs. We just need to be faithful with those people that God's brought into our lives, sharing the good news with lost people. We don't need to learn more techniques The word of God isn't about a technique. It's simply about allowing the living word to do its work in the hearts and lives of people. But we have to be faithful. That's our calling. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's the place for you to start. It's hypocritical for you to want salvation for others when you don't want it yourself. It's also weird. But for us as Christians, it's also hypocritical to say, I'm rejoicing that I'm saved, and I really don't care about you. And we need to get out there and get busy. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have died for us, not to make us more self-centered, but to make us thankful to bring us into a right relationship with God which we couldn't do on our own to forgive us of our sins and restore us to a right relationship whereby we can have fellowship with you we can approach your throne with boldness realizing that you are father and we can call you Abba father and yet at the same time you are the eternal judge and I pray father that our hearts and lives would be surrendered to you in such a way that first of all we would be your children and second that we'd be faithful in witnessing so thank you for our time thank you for your word we just ask that you do great things as you've promised to do in jesus name